Well, welcome on this 4th of July weekend. Today we give thanks for the freedoms we enjoy in this country. We are a blessed people and grateful to those who have served and those who continue to serve our nation. A couple quick announcements this morning. Just a reminder, the next couple weeks during the month of July, we'll be doing these hymn sings. So come a little early, choose your favorite hymn, and we'll look forward to singing them together. Next Sunday is Summer Sunday School at 945. Please join us in the Fellowship Hall. Tom Mitlow from the Blessing Board. That's a nonprofit that helps gather household furnishings for folks and help serve them in our local community. Last year alone, they served 1,115 families for a total of 3,346 folks in total, kids, families, children, everybody. That's very exciting. He's going to talk about how we can be partner with them more in the future. He asked that we bring a pot or a pan, a bath towel to donate to their cause. It doesn't have to be new. Gently used is always nice, but they need supplies, so feel free next week. Join us in the Fellowship Hall. Here's a little sadness. Amanda Kunkel is six months pregnant, but has been confined to bed rest and is at McGee Women's Hospital for four weeks. Prayers are needed for her, her baby, and for Donald, the father. Please send cards of encouragement. If you want more information, please call Lucinda in the church office, and she'll give you the information to send her a card. Just a reminder, the church office is closed um, on Tuesday. It's open tomorrow, but we're going to be closed for the 4th of July holiday. Um, I'm going to have to be slipping out of here on the early side, so forgive me. I'm helping set up a water slide. We do this great activity after church the Sunday before 4th of July where all the families gather and we do water sliding in our backyard. So when you drive out today, take a peek, or if you feel up to it, join us. A couple summers ago, I have to confess, give us a little wave there, Dr. Snodgrass. He uh, joined us in his church clothes. He joined us and jumped on that slide and showed the college kids a thing or two. So feel free to join us if you'd like today at 1230. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. Let us pause as we have thanks and have a moment of silence as we prepare for worship this morning. In your wisdom, O God, you call us here to worship you. <clears throat> you call us to be fully alive with your life abundant, ready to listen and respond with heart, soul, strength, and mind. You call us to be always watchful for your word of wisdom always dwelling among us. We watch.
adoration. Thank you. O God, light of the hearts that see you, life of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you, to turn from you is to fall, to turn to you is to rise, to abide in you is to stand fast forever. Grant us your grace and blessing for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Who shall go up on the mount of the Lord? And who shall stand up in his holy place? The clean of hands and the pure of heart, who have given no oath in a lie, and have sworn not in deceit. They shall bear blessing from the Lord and bounty from the rescuing God. Let us silently and thoughtfully admit to ourselves and to God our need for God's redeeming grace, which can cleanse us and pardon us through Christ our Lord. Hear the words of the assurance of pardon. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Believe and trust in Christ's power to cleanse, pardon, and redeem us. Amen. Amen. continue today in the book of Proverbs from chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. Listen, children, to a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight, for I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender and my mother's favorite, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words. 
keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a fair garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear my child and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in paths of righteousness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Morning. I invite the children to come forward as we talk about the scripture this morning and have you sing as they are welcomed forward. I like that song because it talks about the Holy Spirit guiding not just children but grown-ups too. And our scripture today is an intergenerational scripture. Did you hear that, folks? Did you hear it when Cynthia was reading? That this was scripture, this was wisdom passed down to Solomon from his father and he's passing it on. And that's what we do is we pass on this wisdom. So today, scripture was about the path. The, the good path to take, staying away from the paths that might be um, places where we could get in trouble. And Solomon calls it the paths of the wicked. But today I was thinking about these paths and I'm thinking about, have you you've been on any road trips yet this summer, girls? Well, when you go, does mom or dad use the GPS Do they, on their phone? Yeah, okay, so we, we've come to rely on that GPS when we go out, we, we put it on our phones or in our cars, and it tells us most often the most direct route, right? But it also will tell us if there's an accident up ahead, so we might want to choose a different route or something like that, you know. Sometimes I wish God had that kind of a GPS that could tell us when we're going off the, right, the wrong path. Wouldn't it be great if our phone would say, you might want to stay here, you might want to turn here, to tell us we're going, but God's GPS for us is God's word. So as we read it and we become more familiar with it, we study it, then it helps us to stay on the right path. So we can remember, oh, you know what? I think God would rather I didn't do those kinds of things and walk down a path that I shouldn't go down. So we really do have a GPS. It's in our heart and in our heads that we know God's word so that we can stay on the straight path with God and not go maybe where some folks might want to lead us that either don't know about Jesus or have forgotten about what Jesus has taught us and so try to lead us in ways that we shouldn't be going. So these words of wisdom today were passed down by generation and generation. That's why it's so important that our parents, our grandparents, and other adults that care for us help us to learn God's word too. So we're grateful today for all of those generations. We're grateful for the words in Proverbs that can help us to remind us to stay on the path 
and to know God's word so that we can make those changes when we're on the wrong path. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these words today, these words of wisdom that help to remind us to stay on the path with you. Help us, Lord, to know when we're going down the wrong path and direct us back. Help us to keep our way straight so that we might know you and know what you have in store for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go hear another story of God together. After I graduated from seminary, my husband Kent asked me what I wanted to do to celebrate. And so I told him, I want to go to Disneyland. I had not been to Disneyland for many years. It sounded like fun to me. So we traveled down to Los Angeles area. We were living in Northern California at the time. And I was determined to ride as many of those rides as possible. And all went fine until we came to a ride called Small World. You know that ride? Well, neither Kent nor I knew anything about this ride. So we stood in line, and finally we were seated in one of the small boats. Now, Small World consists of riding in a boat through a dimly lit cavern, and all the while the song, It's a Small World After All, plays over and over and over. You get the idea. And then there are these little dolls that pop up along the way, dressed in outfits from all around the world. Well, partway through the ride, I looked over at Kent's face, and he had kind of a glassy-eyed look, but he didn't say anything, and so finally the ride ended. Well, at one point, Disneyland officials noticed that people were losing interest in Small World. By then, it was about 40 years old, and attendance was falling dramatically. So they updated the ride, and they brought in some new and fresh twists to attract younger generations. Obviously, this was necessary. However, this change brought angry criticism from the fans of Small World because they had altered the Disney of their childhood memories. So the son of the original designer wrote an open letter to Disney executives blasting the changes as a gross desecration of the ride's original theme. Well, that's what happens when you change some people's traditions, even if the change is a big improvement. Because sometimes we worship a memory and it becomes more important than anything else. The Christian faith has many traditions, and individual churches have traditions. Traditions are beliefs and practices that are handed down generation to generation. And uh, traditions are important, but the problem is when they become more important in a church rather than following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Jesus ran into problems with the religious leaders of his day because they held fast to their traditions. For example, in Mark 7, the Pharisees were criticizing Jesus and his disciples because they did not observe a practice of a ceremonial washing of the hands before they ate. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, you abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. So it's important periodically to look at our traditions and see why we're doing them and ask the question if it's important to maintain them. But of course, not all traditions are bad. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. These are very familiar words to us because they're part of the sacrament of communion. They're called the words of institution. And did you hear? The Lord gave them to Paul, and Paul handed them on to the church in Corinth and other Christian communities. And so they have been handed down throughout the centuries. They're part of the liturgy of communion. And so they are a tradition that has great meaning and power for us. But we also have the wisdom tradition in the Bible. And we've been talking about that this summer, looking at Proverbs, which is one of the books called Wisdom Literature in the Bible. And Wisdom Literature talks about a certain approach to life, following God's path of wisdom. And also, for us as Christians, this path is a way of living out in a very deliberate and rational way our commitment to God. Solomon is thought to be the author and compiler of the book of Proverbs. And what we see in the passage today is exactly what Carolyn pointed out. He is passing along to his children what was passed down to him. He said, listen, children, to a father's instruction and be attentive that you may gain insight. When I was a son with my father, tender, and my mother's favorite, isn't that interesting? He put that in writing. <laughs> I was my mother's favorite. He taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Wisdom originally came from God, the source of all wisdom. And then it is passed on to the grandfather, to the son, to the grandson, down through the generations. This tradition of wisdom is a legacy. A legacy is a gift received from an ancestor. And as Christians, we have received this wonderful legacy of wisdom. And we've also received the legacy of the gospel. And we pass along these things to our children, and our prayer is that they would pass them along to theirs. The book of Proverbs presents this legacy of wisdom as a path that we can choose to take. Hear, my child, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom, I have led you in paths of uprightness. So this path metaphor tells us that life is a journey, and we take it one step at a time, and all along the way, there are opportunities to continue on the path or to leave it for the other option. And Proverbs calls that other option the path of the wicked. And anyone can fall away and end up on that wicked path. No one is above it, because at times along our journey, we can be tempted to do things that we know very well God does not want us to do. However, there are also times when it comes to us as a realization that we have been traveling on the wrong path in some particular area of our lives. We realize that somewhere along the way we've adopted an attitude or a behavior that has, in effect, caused a spiritual log jam. Log driving is a means of moving logs from a forest to sawmills and pulp mills downstream using the current of the river. And it was the main transportation method for early logging before there were railroads or road access into the timberlands. But in the process of driving huge quantities of logs down the rivers, sometimes a jam would occur. And then the lumberjack would have to find the log that blocked the flow. 
And when he found that key log, he would jerk it out of place so that the flow could continue. Well, just as there can be log jams on a river, we can have a spiritual log jam. And that, I think you can see readily when things like you start losing your concern about staying on the right path that God wants for you. Or you don't have any more interest in spending time with God. You start putting off your daily devotions. Or you don't get much out of the Bible, so you just stop reading it altogether. You don't come to worship as much. It may even get to the point where you really don't want to spend time with Christians anymore. Well, when our love for God and his ways is waning, it's all too easy to stray off that path of wisdom and begin to follow something else. And if this happens, if we come to this realization in our lives, then we have got to find that key log that is causing the spiritual log jam, and we've got to jerk it away so that the flow of the Holy Spirit can continue fully in our lives. Now, it may be that the log jam is something like an inability or an unwillingness to forgive someone who has hurt you, or it may be jealousy or a critical spirit or some other attitude of rebellion against God and his path of wisdom. You see, attitudes like unforgiveness, self-righteousness, judgmentalism, those indicate an attitude of rebellion. I know we don't think of those things as that, but that's what they are. Because we think to ourselves, I have a right not to forgive that person. That what they did is so terrible. I'm justified in my inability or in my unwillingness to forgive. Or we might say, it's okay for me to be critical of that person. What they're doing is very wrong. These are attitudes of rebellion against God and his path of wisdom. Now, I know I've told this story before, but it is a powerful story, and it's very convicting. Catherine Marshall was the wife of Peter Marshall, a very well-known Presbyterian minister, and at one time a chaplain in the U.S. Senate. After his death, she went on to write many books. She wrote Christian novels and books on the Christian life. Well, in one of her books, she talks about a time when she was led by God to take a day for what she called a fasting on criticalness. She wrote, The Lord continues to deal with me about my critical spirit, convicting me that I have been wrong to judge any person or situation. And she referenced Matthew 7, where Jesus said, Do not judge, or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So when she read this, she felt that God was saying to her that she needed to go on an absolute fast from criticism for a whole day. She would not say anything negative about anyone or anything. Well, she had lunch that day with family and friends, and she was a lot quieter than usual, especially when certain topics came up, like a discussion about the state of the federal government, or the judicial system, or the church. She didn't offer any negative, critical comments. And as the day wore on, she found that this fast from criticism brought some remarkable realizations. One specific thing she mentioned was that how she saw how her prayers for a particular young man had really been very negative. That afternoon, God gave her a specific 
positive vision for this young man's life. And so she began to pray God's vision for him instead of a negative critique of this young man's life. She also saw that ideas began to flow in new ways. She wrote, it was apparent what the Lord wanted me to see. My critical nature had not corrected a single one of the multitudinous things I found fault with. What it had done was to stifle my own creativity in prayer, in relationships, even in writing. Ideas that God wanted to give me. So she was very convicted of how destructive a critical mindset is in someone's life. And so she repented that day of what she called the sin of judgment. And that was a real turning point for her in her life. So I don't know what a spiritual log jam for you might be. It might be a critical spirit, it might be something entirely different. Whatever it is, identify it and jerk it out of place so that once again you can know the life and vitality of the Holy Spirit. That is the way of wisdom, friends. That is the tradition of wisdom. And it's a tradition that brings life. Now, in a few minutes, we are going to have the opportunity to receive the Lord's Supper. I have a specific memory about communion in my home church, where I was growing up. The minister of the church was an older man, and he was very solemn. He was very dignified. I think all of the kids in the church were just a little bit afraid of him. But what I remember about communion is that he would always read that passage from 1 Corinthians 11 that I read earlier. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But then he would go on to verses 27 and 28. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourself, and so then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So the pastor would say those words, profaning the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, in such a serious way, it scared me a little bit because I was afraid I might take communion the wrong way. Of course, those words are not meant to scare us, but they are meant to make us stop and think about our lives before we come to the Lord's table. So we're going to take some time for prayer, some silent time. And there may be a way that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you during this message. Something about your life that may not be pleasing to the Lord or some sort of spiritual log jam that is keeping the flow of the Holy Spirit in, from going throughout your life. You know, at every one of our worship services, we have a time of confession. It's because in our Presbyterian Reformed tradition, we recognize that Human beings are prone to sin. We are prone to falling away from the path that God wants for us. That's just reality. But it's also reality that God always stands ready to wipe out those sins with his grace and mercy. Scripture tells us, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. So let's take some time for that examination that Paul calls for as we come to the Lord's table. And remember, 
If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for your love that cleanses us and heals us no matter how many times we make mistakes, we sin. You always stand ready to offer your forgiveness as we return to you. So thank you, Lord, for this new slate today. And I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us as we leave this place to always walk in the way of wisdom and live lives that are pleasing to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This is the Lord's table. It is broader than a Presbyterian table, but I don't know how many of you history buffs would know that when the World Council of Churches first met, the Presbyterian liturgy was what they used because it is pleasantly broad enough so many, many people of different traditions could participate in it. The Lord Jesus invites us all to share this joyful feast from east and west, from north and south, people will come and take their places at the banquet of the kingdom of God, now and in the future. Come to the Lord's table to sense the wonder of Christ's presence that cleanses the wounds of our lives. We will, he will be gentle, and we will find that rest and renewal he gives to his people when they come to worship together.
Eternal God, holy and mighty, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise and to worship you in every place where your glory abides. On the holy mountain, the divine glory of the incarnate word was revealed. From the heavens, your voice proclaimed your beloved son, who is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. We rejoice in the divine majesty of Christ, who shone forth even confronted with a cross. Therefore, we praise you, joining the voices of the heavenly choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. You are holy, O Lord God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent your only begotten, in whom your fullness dwells, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. Revealing your love, Jesus taught those who would hear him, heal those who believed in him, received all who sought him, and lifted the burden of their sin. We glorify you for your great power and love in Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from destruction and sin and death, and made us a new people by water, the word, and the spirit. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and appeal these gay, your gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion and the body and blood of our Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may in his ministry and every place be one. Unite us in faith, encourage us with hope, inspire us to love. We, we may be your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. And now let us pray that prayer that our Lord taught his disciples, and we repeat even until this day, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On the earth, it is heaven. And forgive us our sins. When we come to this table, and we remember those words, word and sacrament, for John Calvin, the uh, primary theologian of the Reformed Church. The two belong together. The word, you can throw religious words all over the place if you want to, but when you come to the table, now you're going to touch visible, taste things visible, and get closer and closer to that thin veil between us and the eternal. So think about that as you partake in the communion. We've heard it many, many times. The Lord Jesus on the night of his arrest. And that puts it right down in history and augurs it in. It isn't some fantasy somewhere. He really lived. And he took, on the night of his arrest, bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. That visible, visible bread. And said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember who I am and who you are and what we need. In that same manner, he took the cup, probably the cup of thanksgiving, and he broke the mold when he did that because there were four cups. And this may very well have been the Elijah cup, which was left alone of the four, waiting for Elijah to come. So when that cup is held up, that is Elijah's into Christ's among us. And he said to them, and we say to you, this is cup is a new covenant sealed in his blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, and you're experiencing new life in the spirit. Whenever you drink it, do, do it to remember. And every time we come, you're remembering something. That's what we do when we worship. We remember things, proverbs, traditions, the sacred story.
forward from the center, go back to the aisles. If anybody needs to be served in the pews, let us know. We will bring it to you. And if you want gluten-free, we have special cups. Let us pray. Loving God, you graciously feed us who have de seen these holy mysteries, the bread of life from the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises, tell of your glory and truth. Help us, O God, to love as Christ loved. Knowing our weakness, we may stand with all who struggle with temptations and forces which would destroy your grace and goodness in us. Sharing his suffering, we hold up to you the bruised and broken ones, those who face death and those mourning the loss, to desperate ones who ruin their lives with drugs, anger, violence, those who are suffocating under oppression, longing for freedom and justice, held in his love. May we embrace those whom this world denies dignity. Rejoicing in his forgiveness, may we reach out to those who have rejected us and from those we are separated and yet need for their own wholeness. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, eternal God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
friends, may you go from this place filled with the love of God that will encourage you and sustain you as you walk the way of wisdom. And I bless you as you go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.